Uh, just one. My name is Misha Stone, and I'm a Reader Services Librarian. Um, and before we begin this admit event, I would like to acknowledge that we are gathered together on the ancestral land of the Coast Salish peoples. So together, let us also honor their elders past and present. We thank them for their stewardship of this land. As an organization committed to race and social justice, we are proud to partner with the Croy Conference. Fred Hutch, Defeat HIV, and Michael Luella, thank you. Um, thank you for coming to the Central Library. Thank you for coming to the Central Library to share information um, happening with HIV Cure. Thank you so much for hosting this event with us. We are also honored to have Timothy Ray Brown with us again at the library and to celebrate his 12-year Cure anniversary. And before I hand this over to Michael, or I should say to Tony, uh, A. Tony Young will be moderating. I just have a few building logistics to share. As I mentioned, you are not locked in. This door that just opened is the way that you can exit um, and enter again, as well as the door just here uh, behind um, the auditorium. Um, we have restrooms on levels one and three, as well as four and seven. And we have gender neutral bathrooms, both on one, you can request a uh, key at the children's desk and then be buzzed in up on level three. So just so you know that that is happening. Um, this is being recorded for podcast and Facebook Live. Um, and I do want to mention that we do have a New York Times photographer who may be coming later. So if you have any issues with getting your picture taken, let us know. Um, in any case, thank you so much. I'm going to turn this over to our Master of Ceremonies, A. Tony Young. Good afternoon, and thank you, Michael, for the opportunity to moderate this afternoon's session. Uh, this, those of you that were with us this morning, thank you. Those of you that were with us this morning, we had a dynamic group discussion this morning and hopefully it will continue this afternoon. I have the distinct and unique pleasure of introducing our first guest speaker this afternoon and that's Dr. Carl Diefenbach. And I think I, I have the unique pleasure also of being able to call Carl both a, I think a friend and a colleague I've known Carl for decades, and I have uh, had the, the distinct honor of being able to call on him to ask him questions when I've not known something, um, been able to rely on him for very direct advice uh, when I've been lost and struggling with understanding of what to do from uh, a unique uh, perspective as a community member, and I've always uh, relied on him to give me an honest earnest and scientific response. So I'd like to introduce Dr. Carl Diefenbach, who is the director of the Division of AIDS at the National Institutes of Allergies and Infectious Disease, NIAID. Carl? Thank you, it's a pleasure to be here. And just a word about, about Itoni. Um, she was an absolutely important person as we got started in our Washington DC initiative. Gave us sound advice and has been a critical sounding board for us every step of the way. The first thing she said is don't make people go to the NIH, to the building because we're surrounded by a fence and it just sends the wrong message, move your clinics into town. Um, and that was the best advice we could have had. And so I thank her for her st uh, stu stu stewardship and leadership in the community in Washington uh, for the past 15, 20 years. So today what I thought I would do is give a little bit of a primer on cure and talk about it from the standpoint of um, what does cure mean um, what does it mean to cure a virus infection um, and use, um, in addition to HIV, two other examples, but then talk about something else that I think is really important for us to all to understand, and that is how do we measure? 
What are the critical measurements we need to make in HIV? What have been the game changers for assays that have come along that have made a difference in our success in fighting HIV, and why I'm particularly hopeful about where we are today before I get into much of what you've heard already today about where the field is. So Merriam-Webster defines cure as the complete or permanent solution or remedy to bring about recovery from or to permanently restore health or soundness. I think that is something that we all would, would like to be able to achieve for HIV. So what, it would, what, is it, what happens with that when we look at it from the perspective of the virus infections, flu, hepatitis C, and with HIV? So um, uh, on, the, on your right, as you're looking at the screen, um, is the graph of the flu epidemics that occur every year. Um, and as ceaseless as the tide, uh, flu comes annually. Um, and while we have a vaccines, they're usually anywhere from 20 to 50% effective. And the, and the uh, lower panel shows the, the significant pandemics where millions of people have died. Flu is, is not thought to be a big deal. However, if you get it, um, you know it's a big deal. Um, it, 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 the, you're in, it is an incredibly infectious agent. Uh, if it's uncomplicated flu after exposure, you have a short incubation, intense fever, and weakness and fatigue up to weeks at a time. Uh, and then the other concern after you've recovered is as flu evolves, you get to get sick again because flu changes. Um, the current epidemic that we're undergoing with flu is, is not on this map, but actually is tracking the the blue line here almost exactly. Uh, so in terms of a year, it's uh, the equivalent of the, the, the case rate is equivalent to what we saw in 16 and 17. This is where the idea, you've seen a lot in the news about universal flu vaccine, uh, and there's a lot of work going on on that right now. And if we were able to get a universal flu vaccine, we would drop the, the case rate fairly significantly. So here's an example of an infection that is readily controlled by um, uh, humans pretty well. However, it does recur because of the variation. Another, so the one thing that's um, critical to all three of these viruses is variation is a theme. The, the natural variation in the viruses is a theme. So another virus that um, um, is also a significant public health challenge is hepatitis C or HCV. Uh, it's important to note that between 15 and 25% of people who become HCV positive actually clear the infection on their own within the first six months, indicating that there is a role for immunity here that, um, that matters. Um, early in infection, just about everybody remains asymptomatic, and progression to liver disease takes significant amount of time. And we have been able to generate um, a, a body of new medications called direct acting antiretrovirals, which pre creates a cure in greater than 90% of treat people who complete treatment that can last anywhere from as little as eight to as much as 12 weeks. So this is a very significant advance. Fundamentally, however, if you are, if you are cured via drug treatment, reinfection remains possible. And so there is no natural immunity that builds up with infection um, against hepatitis C. So in many ways, like flu, once you, even though when, when you're cured, reinfection is possible. And it may have to do also with the, um, with the level of uh, the lack of ability to generate immunity. Moving on to the virus that makes us why we're all here today. What makes HIV unique from these other two? Now, a central tenant in human immunology, mouse immunology, mammalian immunology, is the purpose of the immune system is to activate and respond to an infection. Um, this, this, it could be seen as a, a challenge to the immune system. The body responds to the challenge and creates an, a response that pretty much most of the time clears that challenge, creates memory and rest and goes back to sleep. So think of it as a fire truck that is tailored to that specific infection. 
It's then, it goes and puts the fire out and parks itself somewhere in the body so that at some point in the future, if the body is re-exposed to that same insult or agent, that fire truck can come out, uh, activate and respond. However, what HIV does is it integrates, it becomes part of the cell that is essential for that response. And as such, as soon as that cell reactivates in response to further stimulation, it further stimulates the growth of HIV. So HIV has found a way to exploit the very core tenet of, of immunology for its own nefarious purposes. Um, and therefore, it remains our, uh, the significant challenge that it is today. And because it becomes part of the cellular DNA is why we actually need to talk about a cure. Because if, 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 even with antiretroviral therapy, if you think about what Merriam-Webster says, a complete or permanent solution or a remedy, or to permanently restore health. Antiretroviral therapy restores health, but not on a permanent basis, because as we are all well aware, it requires, for now, at least one pill once a day. So why, is, why do I care about measurement? And why should you care about measurement? And why should you um, be aware of what assays or technologies have come along that have made a different in a difference in HIV. I think it's important to, for us to understand where we have been and therefore um, have, use those as guideposts for where we need to go in the future as we progress toward HIV, a better HIV vaccine, um, better prevention, and what we need to do for an HIV cure. And not surprisingly, the first assay that came along was the blood test, which allowed us to differentiate who had become came infected, infected with HIV um, and who was, uh, was not. It allowed uh, governments around the world to uh, protect the blood supply, to diagnose those particularly early in disease, because as we were all are well aware, frank AIDS was obvious, but who, who actually was going to progress to AIDS um, was not known, but it wasn't until we had first the blood test and it wasn't until we had a blood test that we were able to then figure out that the CD4 test would be a good marker for disease progression. It also demonstrated um, the extent of an asymptomatic period and was essential for early epidemiologic and natural history studies. So very early in the epidemic, this allowed us to help begin to define what HIV was and what HIV wasn't. The next test that came along had this relatively complex, fairly dense, and not very easy to understand title from a person who many of you may have heard of, Jeff Lifson, who is um, a leading scientist at the National Cancer Institute. What this was, was the very first description of using polymerase chain reaction um, in, a, in a quantitative way to measure the amount of virus in plasma so this was the first example of quantitative plasma viral uh, virus measurements. We all know and speak routinely now about viral loads, but this was the first demonstration that viral load actually mattered. And the title of the paper is quite important. High levels of HIV in plasma during all stages of infection. And that was the message. Is the, there's no such thing as a silent infection here. It is persistent, it's ongoing, the virus grows every day, every hour, all the time, in the human body, and it, needs to, and it needs to be dealt with in that kind of a way. How did this advance the field? Very quickly, from 1993 on, the, the first groups, led by David Ho and Marty Markowitz, and then George Shaw and his team, were able to demonstrate that the drugs we were working on at that time actually had an impact on plasma viral load. And, um, and David and, um, and George's group uh, demonstrated the, the, the test of concept that when you provide a medication to, um, to an individual and their viral load starts to drop, you can literally measure it in days to hours and it didn't need weeks or months or years. Um, and that gave us the, the ability to think about viral load ultimately as a surrogate and that's why in many ways 
that this initial finding got us to where we are today with U equals U. Because without the ability to say somebody is undetectable, therefore, or, or they cannot transmit, we would not be where we are today. So this is why these kinds of assays truly matter. Now, where are we with assays on the cure? So this paper was just published um, from Catherine Bruner in um, Bob Silicano's lab, again with an important title of Quantitative Approach to Measuring the Viral Reservoir of Latent HIV Proviruses. And I hope in five years I can come back to an event like this and I can say to you, this was the paper that has made a difference in cure. Because I think this assay has some specific characteristics of it which we will be able to see if it is capable of what I hope it's capable of, of being able to be the equivalent of measuring um, viral load, uh, but this will be the assay for the cure. And it is a very simple assay. First and foremost, it takes into account that the vast majority of the, the DNA that is present in our bodies um, if, when we're on therapy uh, that, is, that we're carrying in our CD4 cells, the proviral DNA is defective. And only about one in a thousand of those um, is in fact completely intact. And what Bob's lab was able to define was a region here called the size site, which is also known as the packaging site, and a region embedded in the middle of the envelope are highly conserved. And for, in a very simple way, it's essentially two PCR reactions. So again, PCR is going to play a major role. But the output of the assay is brilliant. It essentially looks like a flow diagram. Think about it as a four, remember four square when we were kids? There were always, and the goal was always to get into the fourth square. So you were ahead serve. So square one, which is also known as quadrant three, is, is negative DNA, no, no provirus present. Quadrant one is one of the two regions is present. Quadrant four is the other segment is present. Quadrant two is both segments are present, indicating that any dot in this quadrant indicates an intact provirus. Very simple, very easy. Um, and as such then is a very rapid readout and a significant improvement over the assays we currently have. Importantly, this has worked well um, in terms of measurements, and, it, it, and the group, as part of this paper, was able to show that by measuring these, the intact virus the, and the, the presence of one of the other two markers had different patterns of behavior within individuals over time, indicating that there was, um, as you could see, um, significant fluctuation in the other two um, and a degree of stability in the intact provirus. This is important now if we can get some tools that have an impact on the intact provirus with this kind of a very simple assay that can be run in a day, we'll be able to see a drop, not over a course of years, but days to weeks. So that's why I'm excited about this assay and wanted to um, share my enthusiasm and hope that it, I'm right about this and you can come back and tell me years in the future, if it's not, that I was full of shit. <laughs> so where are we today in our path toward um, a sustained art-free remission uh, for HIV? And in many ways, um, it, there's two paths we can take. We could talk about eradication of the competent uh, HIV reservoir or a classic cure, or we can talk about sustained virologic remission, which would allow us to create a level of immune-based control um, that would prevent viral rebound um, without, um, in the absence of antiretroviral therapy. Um, and as a famous um, baseball player who played for the Yankees once said, Yogi Berra, if you come to a fork in the road, take it. And so we're gonna go through both. So let's talk first about what eradication uh, uh, would look like and what we have in the audience with us today, celebrating uh, Timothy Ray Brown and his 12 years, is, um, is an homage to him in that there is still so much we can learn uh, from Timothy and his case. Um, and 
um, that is, is that Timothy was not only treated for one disease, but he was treated for two. Um, and in some ways, the, uh, as you can see on the graph here, uh, um, in Timothy's story we've all heard, is he had to go through two rounds of chemotherapy and two rounds of immune reconstitution. HIV was taken care of by the first, but his, but his leukemia required a second. So for, for, for patients like Timothy uh, that have two diseases, cancer and HIV, cancer is probably the worst of the two, um, and his leukemia, as it roared back, um, required a, literally a sledgehammer-like approach to help him get through his lethal cancer. Apparently, at this meeting, there's an example of another uh, patient that has had um, a stem cell-based um, uh, full remission, and um, I have not seen the data, and we all look forward to seeing the results in, at CROI for that. So again, congratulations, Timothy. It's great to have you here for your 12th anniversary. There are a range of, of strategies that can be used um, with, and then stem cell transplantation is what we've just discussed, but the significant work has been going on recently using CRISPR-Cas9 and other strategies for gene editing. There are modified antibodies and then latency reversing agents. So to steal a page from the Defeat HIV, um, one of their cartoons from one of their papers, is this is the, the places where there are multiple targets for anti-HIV gene therapy, and I've highlighted a couple on, on this slide. As you can see uh, on, let's see if I can get the arrow to work. With this arrow, it's not showing up on the screen. The, uh, the arrow uh, on the upper right is the use of vectored antibodies. Can you take um, antibodies or other uh, biologics put them in some sort of a gene therapy vector, put them in the body and so that the vector will then lead to the production of this protein, this molecule that will be in the body that will serve to protect the cells from the spread of HIV. Um, currently, uh, we're using broad neutralizing monoclonal antibodies for prevention uh, through studies like the AMP trial that uh, the HIV vaccine uh, trials Network and the HIV Prevention Trials Network are performing, but it's being used also by others in more therapeutic sessions. In more, in, antibodies are also being used um, in therapy as well. But the idea would be not just to give the antibodies, but actually to give the antibodies in a way that the body took care of producing um, uh, that, as a drug inside. The other is uh, um, there's at least one talk at the meeting as well this week on engineering cells so they are genetically resistant to HIV by eliminating the co-receptor, as labeled here by the Delta CCR5 T cells. Um, there are several groups that have been using uh, genetic technology to go in and edit cells so that they lack the co-receptor so they cannot be infected with HIV. And last but not least is the idea of could you use the, these technologies to go in and clip out the provirus directly in a way that um, eliminated the latent virus reservoir um, from, uh, from the cells in the body. There's a lot going on in these areas. Um, and at this point, it is still in many ways ex vivo. We have not quite figured out, and we probably won't for another 10 or 12 years, to how to give it these kinds of technologies as a shot to an individual. But ultimately, that's the kind of thinking we need to get to, is do this in incremental steps, first so it's safe, and build the evidence base and move carefully one step at a time to where it becomes a single shot, um, and uh, we can then have something that can truly make a difference in people's lives. So moving on to uh, the other pathway, um, which is sustained virologic remission in the absence of eradication. Um, the reason this is somewhat attra more attractive at this point in time is this is the kind of a, of a solution that could be low risk to the patient. It could be scalable um, and could p potentially lead to induction of a durable, immune-mediated control um, of the virus. 
So the kinds of things that we could do um, uh, could be the kinds of things that would require um, an intermittent uh, type of delivery of, say, monoclonal antibodies, um, say once yearly, uh, if we could get to a series of long acting, or we could get to a point where we truly induced changes um, in immunity that required no further inter, uh, intervention. I think the challenge with these things are the, the need to, uh, to provide to people who are in an art-free remission time where they have low or no detectable viral load is the tools to self-test for when they would rebound. Um, and I think that we really need that technology to catch up with us to where um, in, the, um, in the privacy of your own home or apartment or, that you could do a dipstick, you could take a, a drop of blood and do a single test that told you whether you had, um, had rebounded or not. Because I think um, we, that's the kind of technology that's going to need to keep up. Also, there's a lot of community interaction that needs to go on in this space because we need informed individuals that understand that they are participating in a, an endeavor of extreme importance. And we, it's, a, it's then a, a pact between the, the doctors um, and the study participants that we all have a role um, to assure the safety of the participant, but we also need to give them the tools as well as the knowledge base so that they understand what they are participating in. So this is a, a, a slide from a very old paper that is now over 20 years old from uh, Rick Davies' group um, at NIH where they took a number of people who had been on antiretroviral therapy for several years and did one of the first structured treatment interruptions. And you can see the vast majority of people in the study uh, rebounded very quickly. But one patient, patient 18 in the study, appeared capable of maintaining significant control of virus replication following this continuation of drug therapy. How can we make this instead of one in 20, make it 20 out of 20 of people that can have this kind of pattern and control? We have to understand what makes this individual unique and what are the is it a genetic activity like what um, we've seen in, in certain individuals, certain HLA types, or is there some other component to this individual's immune system that makes them special? But we have to then figure out how to exploit that and, and bring it to a scale that um, it would benefit um, the other 20 people that participated in this kind of a study. So, as, as we think about art-free remission, um, let's move on and talk about therapeutic vaccination and then talk about passive transfer of broad neutralizing monoclonal antibodies. So a therapeutic vaccine remains in some ways a holy grail. There has been lots of attempts at therapeutic vaccination. Uh, none have had anything more than a statistically significant drop in viral load, nothing that has been um, truly useful uh, to an individual, but it remains an area of emphasis. So I took the liberty of modifying the slide and added the blue lines there at the bottom, because that's my fantasy, that as people are vaccinated and then stay off therapy, that there continues to be profound immune response that continues to drop the level of, of DNA present in, um, in the, the blood and in the tissue of an individual. Um, and then with, with rebound, you would have essentially no rebound. Um, that is the dream. Uh, so th I, there's been at least one study that had some level of effect like this using therapeutic vaccination, using the, um, an AD26 MVA therapeutic vaccination. This is very similar to the, the vaccine that is currently being used by the HBTN in um, the 705 trial for HIV prevention. That trial, the 705, uses AD26 plus protein. Um, the company that uh, was working on this, uh, Janssen, had looked at combinations of AD26 and MVA for prevention, and they're very interested in using a combination of 26 and MVA in therapeutics. 
But what, what this was able to show is that the combination of this with uh, a specific uh, activator of, um, of immunity called TLR7, which is actually an, a strong inducer of interferon, um, it had an effect in, in rhesus macaques. So here's an, an example of a different molecule that was delivered by a gene therapy. And I believe you saw some of this data this morning. Um, the folks from um, Scripps um, uh, Florida uh, were at least on the agenda uh, and talked about ECD4IG as a molecule that uh, was, could be delivered via um, uh, a virus vector called adeno-associated virus. And this is uh, one experiment that they have talked about publicly uh, in the past where animals were um, given uh, AAV or control. And you can see in the animals that received the AAV and produced ECD4 in the blood were able to ultimately control their viremia in the absence of therapy in a pretty profound way. So um, this is a very powerful molecule. Um, it, uh, there are human forms that are being made, and whether or not um, this is um, a part of an ultimate uh, treatment or not um, remains to be seen, but um, it is promising at this time. So in conclusion, uh, I wanted to leave some time for questions. Um, I think we are approaching the end of the beginning. We're not in a point now where there's any clear path toward um, uh, a cure, uh, whether regardless of which branch fork in the highway you've, you've taken, but there's some promising leads out there. Do we have this new assay? Is it, will it be dynamic enough? Will it be the assay that um, we have been seeking? As I said, there are hints of success that are appearing. We will continue to build on our successes, and above all, we will also learn from our failures. But together, um, uh, researchers and community um, working together will ultimately get us to where we can succeed. So thank you. So it looks like we have about 10 minutes for questions. Yeah. Anybody have questions for... Uh... One on the front row. Um, you mentioned uh, the possibility of a, a cure being reported in the first half. Can you tell us when this will be? I, uh, I, it's a, it's a late breaker. I don't know. What day is it? Tuesday. Tuesday. It, it, it's called stem cell therapy and a, something or other. And just Moises. Thank you so much for the presentation. I have two quick questions. Uh, actually, one is, uh, is not a question. Uh, let me begin with it. I want to thank you as NIH and your, your team. For the last three uh, years, you have really tried to involve Africa into the ongoing cure research. And it's really good for Africa that now you're beginning to involve us into the ongoing cure research. Several research is now beginning to take place in Africa, and we pray that you continue involving us. Um, the, the question is, you as a researcher, what are the promising intermittent non at interventions that you think will help us get to the functional cure? So I think for right now, the, the things that are most promising are combinations of monoclonal antibodies and therapeutic vaccines. I think that the kinds of, of treatments for eradication are still very, very early days. Uh, and I don't think, I think we'll need to continue to um, look at some of the, the gene therapy activities more in, v, more in cell culture first before we start headed in the direction of putting things directly in people. So those are the kinds of things that as you are well aware, um, when we started the AMP trial, we went not just to the United States, but also directly to Africa at the same time. So these are the kinds of things that 
uh, with the antibodies that, that could immediately begin with global trials, not just limited to the United States. And we've got two over here, too. Okay. Hi, Carl. So, you know, I'm wondering you that you guys have been loving these monoclonal antibodies for a while, and first we thought it would be one, and then two, and then three, and maybe once a year, and now once every quarter. I mean, they're going to be so expensive. I mean, I, I can't help to think about the nitty-gritty stuff that comes after. And so what's going to make that any different than the new long-acting other drugs that we have in the pipeline? I mean, the price is really what's... Uh, What's gonna, what makes me feel like there might be a chilling effect? So whenever I talk about these, you are in my ear. Um, and one of the things we are continually talking about is, uh, is understanding what the cost will be and making sure it is competitive with PEPFAR-type pricing. I think it has to be. Hello. Uh, my name is Mario. I'm from Cuba. Um, I, I'm wondering, see, because my background is from Spain, from Barcelona, uh, I have the CCR5. I live with HIV for over 38 years, and I'm doing well. Um, I'm wondering, see, is possible to do that test, or, or how the doctor knows see, I have this CCR5? Are you asking what how many people have those kinds of mutations? No, I'm asking see I can do the test for figure it out, see I have the... There was a presentation this morning around the CCR5. He was basically asking, how does she get the test to see if she can get in that file? Uh, since I wasn't there, I don't know, uh, but there are... You work at NIH, don't you? <laughs> 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 is, it a, is, it, is it an NIH trial? Yeah. No. Okay. But you work at the NIH. I don't do you? work at the NIH. So uh, there are. I'm going to let Katie take this one because I don't. I, I don't know the answer. There are specific tests that you can have to know whether you are have the mutation and or would be eligible to participate in such studies. I would say, talk to your doctor. Right, and I think that we can figure out how you can, who it is that, because uh, there was somebody that spoke specifically about the CCR5 trial, and we can find out who that person is and get you in touch with I, them. I, it's, the, the group at Michael. Penn it was doing a lot of that work. Right, and we can talk to Michael and figure out how to get you in contact with yes. that person. I think that's the easiest way to do that, yeah. to get you off the hook. Well, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Hi, I'm Corrine, UNC. Where do you see behavioral and social science fitting in the HIV cure research agenda? Where do you see what? Behavioral and social sciences. So I, I think that uh, behavioral and social science is, is, is driving the discussion between community uh, so that we have understanding of people's perceptions. And I think that that, that is a critical uh, component going forward. Also, to continue to talk about the ethics of what we are doing, particularly as we start moving towards scale. That's why I mentioned the business of the need for certain types of measurements that are available to people. But yeah, clearly then, behavioral and social science would need to be able to help with the, the teaching, but teaching's two ways. Teach the scientists as well as teach community. There remains grants available for behavioral and social science research through NIMH, through Child Health, and NIDA for cure-type activities. NIDA, yes, n n drug, because of, of the ability to do cure in the presence of drug use. So my question is kind of cure-related. Um, I really am very excited about all this research. I think that something will happen at some point, some sort of functional cure or something, but I don't think it's going to apply to somebody like me with a long, long history and a deeply, deeply embedded, embedded reservoir, and I'm kind of old now. Um, <laughs> that said, I, I'm very excited about it. I want to see it all move forward. But part of this is also that, you know, we have these long-acting injectables coming. 
We have these pills that are really easy to take. We have fabulous therapy. It's not that bad living a life with HIV, except for the chronic inflammation. And if there is some way that for people like me and others, you know, to sort of shut that down to prevent these comorbidities and the premature aging and all of that, because your immune system is mounting this constant response. So I would think, hopefully, in all of this research, maybe we can figure out some way or something will surface to sort of silence the body's recognition of this virus and or you know, other methods on the chronic inflammation. Uh, thank you for that comment. I, I couldn't agree with you more. I think what is left behind in the, when, with antiretroviral therapy are these defective viruses that are essentially every, in, every cell carrying, a, whether it's a defective provirus or an intact provirus, literally spits out stuff all the time as it activates. And so it is acting as a flare. So if you think about what I said about immune activation, is HIV lives for immune activation and actually always leaves the embers behind to maintain that. So as we get ready to eliminate the intact provirus, we also need to be able to clear um, the, the, the junk behind. And if you think about the, what you're talking about, the level of immune activation, for people who are elite suppressors, they have very high level of immune activation and have, in many ways, more comorbidities than people just on therapy. So it is a, a significant problem. We have tried many different tools to try to knock down immune activation without success. It's not simple. If it were, if it were simple, we'd be done with that part of it. Well, you might, you might have answered my question uh, with, with, with his response, but I was gonna ask you about in terms of a uh, curing the virus uh, is a dynamic. Is is information coming out? You say like a measured pace, or are there really kind of uh, signs of a? Uh, here we found a lot of information about how to cure a virus, and we're letting it out to you, and then it takes another like 15 years. I mean, would you say it's dynamic research, or it's really kind of long and drawn out? Both. Um, there are there's occasional, like many fields, there are incremental progress all the time, and occasionally you take a big leap. Um, and um, that's the kind of thing that we just need to plan for because we will continue with the incremental and, and get there. But somebody, that's the beauty of research, is there will be somebody. I should, I should have said I'm a doctor, so that's, I'm, I'm, I'm on that side of the, of the question. Okay. okay, thank you. I have time for one more. This may be the, the last one. I think you'll like this one. Uh, thank you, Dr. Diffenbach, for being here. I appreciated that you mentioned U equals U in the beginning when you were tracing some of the successes. And particularly in light of the assays you were talking about, I wonder if you could reflect on how U equals U changes the landscape for cure research, because we've had quite a bit of discussion about that this morning. Many people living with HIV are very concerned about cure being defined as not being able to pass HIV on to a partner. So could you reflect on that for us? I'm not sure I exactly understand the question. I think um, so much of the research is around looking at either, as you said, the two roads of eradication versus um, ART-free remission. Right. And yet, when we talk to people with HIV, sometimes their thought is really, I mean, certainly eradication would be great, but in the short term, people are really concerned about not being able to pass HIV on. So in the context of U equals U with therapy, right, uh, right why should right, we right. pursue... Oh, uh, so then you undergo a structured treatment interruption, you're yeah. virally suppressed, and you have this rebound, and then you suddenly have virus in your body again, and uh, you could potentially transmit. That's and why even, I was making the point yeah, about the Even just assay. without therapy, right, that maybe the threshold uh, is higher than that. Uh, you know, you may still be able to pass it on, even though you're theoretically controlling, right? Well, uh, that's an interesting question. I don't, I mean, we have had, so... Remember the O52 trial had a cutoff of 400 because that was as good as the assay. So if you had a viral load under 400, you were essentially declared undetectable. Now we're talking about under 20 or under 50. So is there a window there that is still okay? Um, if you go back uh, to some of the early work with other regimens, when cutoff was 1,000, 
uh, the, there's a, at least one case that where somebody had a viral load over 1,000 where there was a transmission event, and it was in the first six months prior to full establishment of control. So the, there may be actually a greater forgiveness. If you think about, and, and this gets into a mathematical argument, if you think about 1,000 copies per milliliter um, and the amount of, of blood that is usually uh, around, I mean, that's like one virus particle per microliter. I mean, so it's not a whole lot of virus. Uh, so I think we just have to think about it from the standpoint of when somebody is not taking therapy, um, that they're, they're monitored as closely as possible. At the same time, here's another um, uh, role for behavioral and social science. Is there a way to make sure that partners are engaged and participate, not in a bad way, but in a way that they're equally informed? And so the, the partner... Um, knows that PrEP is an opportunity for them uh, during the period of their partner being under a, a, a treatment interruption. But, you know, this is where quality informed consent and talking to study participants will make a big difference.